Amy. I'm a recent uh, Hunter College graduate now reporting for the New York Post. And I did this story uh, in Sweden, focusing primarily on asylum laws, how they've tightened over the years, over the past two years specifically, and the impact on child refugees. So it was focusing on people who are under 18 and in Sweden without family unaccompanied. Um, the story starts here in Mollendal, which is in southwest Sweden. This is an asylum center for youth. So everyone here is 17 and under, and most of the kids here are still awaiting uh, processing for their applications, which means they're not yet sure if they can remain in Sweden permanently or if they'll be returned to their home country. Most of them come from Afghanistan, Iran, and the Horn of Africa. Interestingly enough, a lot of the Syrians traveled and remained within family units, so there aren't a lot of unaccompanied uh, Syrian children in Sweden. Um, but before we can talk too much about that, it's important to underscore who exactly is a refugee, because uh, legally, most people coming into Sweden don't qualify for refugee status. Um, according to Swedish and EU law, a refugee is defined as an individual fleeing targeted persecution for some sort of identifying reason that they're being. It could be race, religion, gender, nationality, political beliefs, some sort of other affiliation they have. But most people qualify for a subsidiary protection, meaning that they're living in a place that's quite dangerous where they can't survive and thrive and sustain a safe life. Um, so places like Afghanistan, Kabul, places where you have suicide bombings, um, and they will qualify for this subsidiary protection. Um, so UAM is another term for unaccompanied minor. And so this slide kind of outlines the burden of proof that's on the government if they wish to send a minor back to their home country. The first step is defining who are you and where are you from. And this is automatically a little bit problematic because a lot of documents in these countries where these kids are coming from are easily forged and don't have a lot of, uh, you know, security um, sort of things that maybe other documents might have in either the U.S. or Europe. Um, and step two is figuring out where the family is and whether they can be located with certainty. Uh, that's quite difficult because pretty much all of the kids I met um, had lost contact with their families with the exception of maybe two that had suddenly regained contact after like two or three years of not being in contact with them. Um, most people were either traveling with their families along the refugee trail and lost track of them or were sent by their families who had enough money to send them to Sweden. but somehow they can't uh, maintain contact because of conditions in their home country. And step three, if you can find a family, is figuring out um, whether that family will receive a child and care for them if they're sent back to their home country. Uh, so that's really a heavy burden of proof, which is why a lot of unaccompanied <coughs> children with Sweden are allowed to remain there until they turn um, into adults, at which point their asylum process changes because once you're an adult, you can eliminate this whole slide. You don't need to find somebody's family when they're 18. You don't need to have anybody caring for them in their home country. You can take somebody and send them back immediately and deport them for mostly <coughs> any reason if you don't feel that they qualify for that refugee status. So the problem is that a the uh, waiting time when I got into Sweden as of June 2017 was 500 days and counting. And that's the amount of time it has taken for the government to process the asylum applications of kids. And so each one of these days passes and they're getting closer to turning 18. And the key point here is that the decision being made about your application is based on how old you are when you're finished being processed. So if I arrive in Sweden at 16 and I have a lot of legitimate reasons to have fled my home country in search of asylum, 
well, the government might not process me until I turn 18, at which point they might say, okay, but you're an adult now, you can fend for yourself for sending me back to Kabul, which was the case of one person I met um, who was being deported. Um, so here's a little graphic just to help illustrate the difference between decisions when refugees and migrants are minors versus when they're adults. And you can see it almost completely reverses. As a minor, you have uh, most people who happen to be processed. Remember, that's a very small number of people who are processed as minors. 75% of them are accepted, and only 12.5 are rejected. And then you have your other decisions. Um, they could be going through an appeals process, or there could be some stalling. And then as an adult, you have almost 75% rejected and roughly the same numbers before accepted, around 12.8. 12, 12 um, so it's quite critical what age you are uh, when your application is finished processing. Um, so amidst all of this, there obviously are people who care for these kids on a daily basis while they're waiting to be processed. And here are just a few of the people I spoke with. Um, the first one here is Yana, and she's a staffer at the asylum center I visited. Um, and she kind of interacts with the kids on a daily basis and provides for them. Uh, she's sort of a mothering figure. Uh, Brigida works above Yana at the administrative level. Um, she doesn't interact with the kids on a you know day-to-day -day basis, but she oversees the providing of resources to them. Sarah is part of Save the Children, which has had an instrumental role in the refugee crisis, and um, she's somebody with whom I discussed policy. And Arito de Gavro is an asylum lawyer who's dealt with a lot of these uh, child asylum applicants, um, who firmly believes that the government of Sweden is purposefully stalling the applications so that people will uh, become 18, at which point they can be easily deported. So. Um, a lot of the refugees that came in in 2015 uh, are in that situation where they haven't been processed. Um, here's a quick timeline to help break it down. Uh, October 2015 is peak arrival time. More than 160,000 refugees come into Sweden, more per capita than any part of the world. November 2015, um, or more per capita than any part of Europe, I should say. Then the next month, you have uh, this legislative reaction to that. Um, the open door closes, EU minimums are implemented, Sweden begins taking very few people. Um, <coughs> July 2016, there's more amendments to the asylum law, making permanent residency almost impossible to achieve, making family reunification nearly impossible. Um, in September of 2016, there's an age exam meant to test out uh, whether or not refugees are in fact minors, showing distrust of them by the government. Then uh, my arrival date, June 2017, most migrants are still not processed. Uh, so the question, we'll skip over this because it's running out of time. The question um, I was also looking at is what caused this crackdown in uh, asylum policy, and a lot of it is attributable to a rising right-wing faction within the government. Um, the Sweden Democrats, uh, this is Matthias Carlsson, the parliamentary leader of the Sweden Democrats, which are now the country's second most popular political party. Um, I met with him face-to-face -to, -face to discuss the change of policy, and um, it's quite evident that they're fostering a distrust of refugees. Um, there's a sentiment that Sweden is not safe, um, and it's a lot of the populist kind of sentiment you're seeing within the U.S. Um, and while they hold just under 6% of parliamentary seats right now, um, they're surging in the polls, uh, again, as the second most popular party ahead of the September 2018 election. So I guess it's not a very happy end to the story, um, but it does help to explain that huge shift in policy. Um, so thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Ipa, and my and then my my classmate Joan and I, uh, we go to Northwestern University in Qatar, and we decided to go to Malaysia to um, talk about the education and mental health problems that refugee children face. Um, so 
We want to introduce you to Hassan, who is a 17-year-old Syrian refugee who's living in Malaysia. He came to Malaysia as a 14-year-old um, from Damascus, where he had just started, um, where they had just started experiencing the, the problems of war. And in his journey to, um, to Malaysia, from Damascus to Aleppo, and then to, on to Malaysia, he, he met a lot of um, people that he, he ended up losing. He ended up, his friends ended up dying. His relatives ended up dying. Um, so he came to Malaysia as a really sad child who was looking for some hope and some safety. But he came with a lot of dreams of being able to go back to his country to rebuild, to rebuild it. Um, when he came to Malaysia, he didn't know um, he didn't know the language, he didn't know Malay, neither did he know English, so he spent his time watching movies so he could learn the language. Um, and eventually he, was, he now speaks English very well, and in our documentary we actually interviewed him in English. Um, and so now a little bit of context about Malaysia. Malaysia has 149,000 registered refugees, and UNHCR estimates that there are about 40,000 unregistered ones, and even maybe a lot more. Um, and so refugees are allowed to come to the country. They, so people usually, the way people can come into the country is because Malaysia gives a lot of on arrival visas to a lot of different nationalities. So they're able to come to the country initially, but staying is a problem. Uh, if they wanna be, become permanent residents, then they have to pay a lot of money, which they usually don't have. So then they apply to UNHCR department in Malaysia that gives them a card that allows them the refugee status. But what this card does is it does not, it just allows you to stay in the country. It does not protect you from anything else. Even uh, people who do have the UNHCR card are susceptible to getting arrested or deported. So there's no sort of like guarantee that you will be safe. There's just a little more safety having that card. And again, UNHCR is a big department, has, has so many refugee, uh, uh, refugees trying to register with them, so they take a long time to process. Another thing we need to consider is Malaysia is a transit country, so people cannot, refugees cannot stay there forever. They come there and they try to uh, find asylum in other countries while they're living in Malaysia because, they, because of a few things. Um, so these are some things, that, these are certain things that June and I thought about, whether about human rights and what, what most people expect out of them. And some of, the thing, some of the things that came up were education, healthcare, and the right to be able to work. Um, Malaysian refugees have none of these. Um, Malaysian children are not allowed to go to public schools. They're because uh, the government does not want Malaysian children to go, uh, I mean, refugee children to go to public schools. Um, and going to private schools is very difficult for them because private schools ask for a lot of money, which they don't have. So what usually ends up happening is that there are a few NGOs that start their own schooling, which does not, which is not sort of like, it does not have any sort of system. It's not official. They don't get any certification. So while this may be a good system of learning for them, they don't end up getting anything out of it uh, while they're learning. And a lot of times what happens is like very, like different kinds of ages end up staying in the same class. Uh, so when we went, we saw nine-year-olds with like in like kindergarten classes. Um, so that's what ends up happening a lot of times when there's no sort of proper system of schooling. Um, so yeah, like I said, the only means of learning is through these NGOs for the most part. Um, yeah. um, all right, so my name is Joanne. I'm gonna just jump back to the story of Hassan. So when he came, when he first came to Malaysia, he was 14, and in the beginning, his father was working as a professor at a local university, and that's how they, um, how they um, ate and just just lived their lives. But um, Hassan's father got um, really sick, so he, Hassan's older brother and Hassan had to um, survive on their own and make a living for the family. So uh, Hassan started working at a restaurant as a dishwasher. So as a 14-year-old child, washing dishes from morning to night was just too much for him was very physically exhausting. So he would go to the mosque to pray and his boss would find him like fall, falling asleep. Eventually, because Hassan is very hardworking and smart, he, he became more of a chef than a dishwasher. And one day when he was at the cashier just receiving money from c c the customers, um, a police officer came into the restaurant and arrested everyone. And that's when he was arrested 
and he had to stay in the detention center for nine days. And he describes his nine days as one of the darkest time of his life. So in the detention center, physical abuse, sorry, physical, emotional, verbal abuse is very, very common. When, when Hassan was first arrested, he was slapped by an immigration officer who asked him how old he was, and he said he was 14. And she said, do you, do you not know that it's illegal for you to work in Malaysia since you're a child? And he was slapped. So the detention center condition, um, I would say, is inhumane. They're not really given proper food, they're not given water to drink. So if you see the image in the middle, you can see the, the toilet tube, and that's how most of the people in the detention center had to drink. And his parents sent him money, food, and clothes, but he only received the clothes because the other officers, uh, offic uh, officers in the, at the center took, took them away. And the space, as you see in the third picture, is very claustrophobic. He was um, stuck in a very small space with 20 other people, and the people who were arrested um, range from 12-year-olds all the way till 40 or 50. And unfortunately for Hassan, he experienced sexual abuse by a, by a male immigration officer, but we decided to omit this detail from our reporting because we wanted to protect his privacy. But for a lot of people who, by people I mean the refugee children who are arrested and released, they suffer severe mental health. For example, Hassan says that even though it's been years since he got out, he, feels, he still feels like he's nothing because of the slapping and the, the sexual abuse. And other refugee children who are not necessarily arrested, they suffer from PTSD because they've seen death of their families or friends uh, on their way um, out of their countries. And some refugee children's Trauma comes in the form of short-term memory loss, so they have a hard time focusing during class. A counselor told us that some refugee children uh, are really driven and they are trying really hard to focus in class, but because they're so traumatized, their mind is um, their mind is wired to forget. So this affects their education as well. Despite all these problems, such as abuse and trauma and mental health issues. Refugee children like Hassan are very, very smart and very talented. And we want, we, what we got out of our reporting experience is that people like Hassan, refugee children, are not a subject of pity. They are not just poor people that you see, feel bad, and move on. These are people who are, who have the potential to go back to their countries and rebuild, rebuild their countries that are sort of in a state of destruction. Hassan says. I need to study because I still have a dream to rebuild my country. Education is my gun. With education, I can fight and I can destroy the war. We want to emphasize the importance of education for these children because even though they've, well, they've gone through so much, these experiences make them stronger and make them more focused on their dreams. So some of the counselors that we met said that refugee children tend to know better on their goals compared to other local children. Thank you. So, as you can see, the, my project was on alternative education, changing the picture of rural India. So, this begins with um, why I decided to cover this story. One of the reasons uh, that I did this story is that I really uh, do not agree with the education system of India. And you might hear some people saying that it, it's the best in the world or something like that. But for me, it was very stressful, and this was one of the reasons why I decided to come to, uh, to the US and complete my education. So um, in this particular project, I decided to cover a story of this small village uh, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This state is the northernmost state in India, and this particular region is called Ladakh. To um, to explain Ladakh, I would simply say that it's a uh, it's a region located at an altitude of il almost about 11,000 feet, and villages here are scarcely populated. There are very few hundred people living in these villages. Uh, when you talk about the life there, it's really really hard. Winters, especially uh, when there is snowfall, the roads are blocked. There are not many people uh, in in this area, so they are not able to uh, clear the snow and then this again causes problems when it comes to the transportation of basic food supplies or other supplies 
And then uh, when you talk about the people and what they do here is, uh, so basically people here depend on agriculture. And when it's uh, winter, they are doing nothing for almost six months. So their kids, uh, most of these families you can describe as low income family. And these kids, uh, they go to uh, government schools available in these villages. So when it comes to education, um, uh, education in these government schools of India, <clears throat> like most government schools in India, absenteeism uh, of teachers is common in Ladakhi government schools as experienced by the students. And students in the rural part of Ladakh often drop out for many reasons to earn money, to help their family, and also because of like uh, there's a lack of qualified teachers, and they end up being uh, they feel demotivated, they feel discouraged, and they decide to just quit school. Um, So, <clears throat> imagine yourself, you are one of these kids who live in this village, and you go to one of these government schools, where most of the time these teachers are either absent, or when they are there, they are not qualified enough to teach you. And your family, you belong to this low-income family, they cannot afford to send you to private schools which are a little bit better than the government schools. So you decide that, okay, I'll opt out, I'll not go to school, so what else do you do? So this particular kid, Stalzin Chokro, he decided that he'll go to Siachen Glaciers, which is near the Himalayas, and work as a porter. And there he worked with the Indian Army, where it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very hard life there are many potters who lose their life just because it's a very risky job. They are at this altitude of 15 to 16,000 feet and there the temperature is negative 30 to 40 degrees Celsius and they are there helping the army just to earn a little bit of money to help support their family. So among all these things, something happened, something different happened in this particular region which was this movement called Students' uh, Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh called Sekul. So how it got started? Uh, it began as movement in 1988 to change the education system of Ladakh in which only 5% of, uh, of all the students could pass their 10th grade. So the problem was not the students. Again, the problem was that there were no teachers, there were no one to su uh, supervise these teachers in government school, and the curriculum was uh, very complicated to understand for these kids. When they, gr they grow up speaking and learning uh, their native language, their mother tongue, which is Ladakhi, and then when they go to school, they suddenly come across this new language, English. So what they do is to get through the classes, they start memorizing stuff. And what this leads to um, this leads to a kind of education where they are not understanding anything. They just memorize it, give, uh, write whatever is uh, asked in the exam, and they get through the class. And they understand nothing. <clears throat> but after this movement, um, a lot of things happened. A drastic improvement was noticed in the Ladakhi education system after the movement started. There were village education committees that were formed to engage the locals, and the language of the textbook was changed to overcome linguistic barriers due to ethnic diversity. And sorry for this confusion. I don't know why it does it look like this, but yep. And then uh, over uh, over the years, um, seventy-five percent of the uh, of the students could pass their tenth uh, grade by two thousand five. So which is like um, in 15 years, the percentage of students changed. But then later on, the school developed to this, uh, this movement developed to the school of alternative education. So what is alternative education, uh, according in simple words, it's just a form of education where they, you, it's not formal, but they use other vocational training and other kind of courses to give you practical learning.
but this would not qualify as a formal education. So what did uh, what this did? Uh, this school came up with three uh, different programs. So students who dropped out from the school, they for them they started this uh, one year course called the foundation year, in which they don't uh, force the student to memorize anything or they don't grade them, they don't have any exam for these students. These students basically learn through experience, uh, through practical knowledge. So they, they live with the faculty there, they live with the staff and the volunteers, and they learn um, everything by doing. So for example, um, say um, sustainable living, how to use uh, sustainable technology in everyday life. So in this particular school, they have to installed, they basically call themselves as an eco-village where they have all the technologies which are eco-friendly and sustainable technologies and these kids are used to uh, using them. So they use solar water heater, they use solar cooker to cook their food and uh, they most of the time they don't have electricity like in a they they'll have electricity for like five to six hours and imagine that when it's negative 30 during the winters you have no electricity what you're depending on is the solar energy so all right i got a time update there other things that these kids do is they maintain the whole campus they basically run the whole campus by themselves they have their own government uh, these students rotate between them, themselves and they run the student uh, council and they also uh, have the responsibility to maintain the campus so if there's some construction going on they will help the uh, laborers to make it happen and then they also when it comes to everyday like cooking and producing their own food so these students maintain the, their own greenhouse there are like five of them and during the summer they farm so when i went there uh, it was may and they had just started to uh, plow the field and that's what was happening and then they also help in cooking <clears throat> other thing uh, which is very interesting about the school is what uh, what volunteers from around the world uh, do for the school so the school invites volunteers from uh, different countries and they basically spend almost a week or months or uh, almost a year with these students and they teach them different skills. So it could be uh, basic maths, science, geography, um, art and craft, language. And how these students learn to speak English is they basically have this uh, conversation class with the volunteers every day for one hour where they sit down with the um, volunteers and they talk about different topics and that's how i saw that in front of me that there was this kid who knew nothing about english except for the basic alphabet a b c d and then in six months he was able to speak a very good english fluent english and <clears throat> The school is also promoting uh, sustainable, like I said, they are promoting sustainable technologies. So I think it's time for me to stop, but I would just uh, end this presentation by saying that why this story mattered to me. So this, the story is about this village where the kids, they had no idea about their future. They were just, they lost, they had lost their, all the hopes that what they would do with their future and they were going for such low paying jobs at the age when they were supposed to enjoy their childhood but with the school it opened their mind they were able to do things on their own they had creative ideas they decided to not give up and come out of that situation and uh, get educated and uh, do something for their own local community so Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Gareth Smale, and I am a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I focus on educational linguistics. And I spent some time this summer in Morocco, um, looking at how um, language and uh, education policy reforms have been affecting students and teachers there. So, uh, just 
one important piece of background information about Morocco is that it's a multilingual country um, in, multi, in multiple senses of the term. Um, first off, it has two standard languages, Arabic, which is the language of education and administration, but then also uh, Berber or Tamazight is another standard uh, official language, which has more of a tokenistic role. Um, and then most Moroccans speak colloquial versions of one of those two languages, which is, are very different from the standard. Um, and then in addition to that, um, once at school, um, students are exposed and taught through standard Arabic, but then also are exposed to a standardized version of Tamazight, um, French, which is the most important language of commerce, and then eventually and increasingly English. Um, so for some students, this uh, uh, language diversity is an enormous, set, an enormous asset. Um, and they're able to become really um, uh, identify as multilingual um, individuals uh, in a very uh, you know, true and real sense of the term. But for others, it's really not. And it's a, it's a struggle and a challenge. And so uh, that's where I want to start um, talking about uh, someone I met named Hussein. And he was a student in uh, chemistry, master student in chemistry, in the Moroccan city of Meknes. Um, and he grew up in a Tamazight-speaking household in the uh, rural uh, Middle Atlas uh, region of Morocco. And uh, he has, throughout his educational career, he's had to, um, uh, he's had to speak in, or deal with three additional languages um, as, he's, as he's gone on. So first, Arabic, uh, then later French, and now English. So when he first began at his uh, primary school, he was utterly unaware of what was going on in uh, his classroom, which was completely in Arabic. His teacher was severe, uh, spoke only, uh, prohibited Tamazight, and spoke only, or, and, and, and enforced that with punishment. And so eventually he actually learned Arabic, but uh, French never really stuck. So he basically memorized his French exams, passed, managed to get by, but then by the time he got to the university, uh, he enrolled in science because that was his strength, but sciences like chemistry and Moroccan universities are taught in French. So he was expected to sit in a 500 person lecture hall and take verbatim notes in French in a language that he never really learned. So he repeated a year just trying to get used to uh, <coughs> just trying to get used to the format, but really never, and admitted to me, he never really learned French. He still sort of gets by. But then he went on to do a master's degree, and in his master's degree, he's expected, like all graduate students are, to engage with original research. And because he's a scientist, that original research is almost always in English. So now he's dealing with an additional language, in addition to being expected to write and you know, get by and present in, uh, in French. So. Uh, the Moroccan government has come up with a sort of uh, program that uh, is purported to be able to address some of the concerns or some of the, some of the challenges that students like Hussein face in Morocco. So what the program does essentially is, it is it's called the International Baccalaureate, and it allows students at the high school level that concentrate in science to begin, study, uh, to begin taking their courses in French and some very small cases um, English and then pass the national exam that way. And if you can think about Hussein's story, and in fact he insisted to me that that would be, that he would have, he would have loved to have that opportunity had it been presented to him when he was a high school student. Um, so, if you could, and you can think of how it would make sense for him. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, it's also uh, trying to deal with a certain economic regressiveness of the policy, wherein students who are able to get access to French through private schools, through tutoring, through help at home, have a leg up once they get to the university, whereas those that don't um, are, really, uh, are really at a disadvantage, like Hussein. Um, and so, uh, let me just Right. So, and, but the, you know, a really remarkable part of this program is that it's a first step um, in a different direction from Morocco, which has had the 60-year project called Arabization. And so what that has essentially mean is since uh, the time of independence, they've, been trying, they've tried to switch over education and administration into Arabic. So, uh, so and this has, happened, this has happened sort of gradually. So the final, uh, the final phase of this, which is high school science and math, was switched over in the late 1980s. So the International Baccalaureate Program has taken steps to roll back this for some students. And, um, and 
you know, it seems like the Moroccan government has been able to do this in a way that avoids some really toxic pro uh, politics around the status and role of Arabic within Morocco versus French and versus Temizip. Um And, you know, generally this, uh, as reported in the press, this program has been a huge success. Um, the first cohort graduated in um, last year and 97% of them passed the baccalaureate exam. That's kind of unheard of in Morocco for this, this final examination. Usually the passing rate is closer to 60. But so one of the questions I had is, is this uh, huge differential in success really the whole story about this program? And so what I did is I went to uh, the region of Khanifra, which is more in provincial Morocco, and actually the region from which Hussein um, comes. And um, so I wanted to know more about uh, how this was affecting students and teachers in provincial Morocco. Um, in essence, very quickly in talking to administrators, I found out that uh, the differential results in this program came not from uh, some inherent um, uh, superiority of teaching uh, science in uh, French or English, as one would expect, but because of this program essentially has been concentrating the very best uh, students in each school um, uh, to participate, whereas leaving out the students that were, um, uh, were not as strong. And this sort of builds on, a, on a, an existing system in Morocco uh, that just briefly um, divides students that study humanities and letters or uh, literature um, as sort of the lower performing students and science focusing students as the higher performing students and then takes out that very small like chunk of the highest performing students to then teach them in French. Um, so, uh, and this can be seen uh, at one of the schools I visited, um, in, it's a, a village in this in a region called Kubeb. Um, there, uh, this school has about 250 uh, you know, seniors in high school, and uh, a little less than half of them study science, about 115. Um, but of those, only 19 are studying in French. Uh, everyone else is studying in Arabic. So that's sort of repeated there. And so what the effect that this has had, at least from my conversations with students and teachers, is that it's created this whole you know, sort of little system of eliteness just within this school, for example. So I spoke with one student. Um, her name was Basma, and she um, talked about how much she loved the program, how she, uh, it really sort of went along with her ambitions uh, to, being, um, to being a doctor. And uh, she, she said that studying in French, for her, it felt like she was studying the real thing, whereas, uh, whereas those that were studying science in Arabic somehow um, weren't studying the real thing. But then she admitted, sort of as a, as a part of that, that, that uh, the program had even created some, some conflicts over language within the school, where uh, other students were complaining about the international students speaking French in the hallways and such and such. And such. Um, teachers have also had a pretty similar experience of really enjoying teaching, um, teaching these classes, but also because they're smaller class sizes, they're able to get further with the material um, versus the, the science classes that are taught in Arabic. So, um, uh, yeah, and so, um, but the, basically this, so this, uh, this sort of elite feel of these programs has actually been um, a roadblock to the ministry's plans to uh, expand this program because, in essence, uh, for example, the school in El Kabab, they take, um, they take about 30 to 35 students every year uh, to participate, but usually that's anticipating that five to 10 of the students will drop off because they can't keep up or they fear that they can't keep up with the academic material. And I spoke with one English, uh, one, uh, English uh, teacher in the school who also talked about how the students that take science and Arabic have come to sort of almost expect and sometimes even ask for lower standards vis-a-vis uh, -vis the students that are studying in French. So um, I guess the question I have uh, sort of based on this experience is, or based on, this, uh, based on some of this, is um, whether, uh, whether these types of language policies or tinkering with language policies are really getting at the core of what uh, was preventing Hussein from having a smooth educational trajectory um, towards the university. And I would say that uh, maybe looking in the long term, uh, the policies like this could have um, some positive impacts for some students, but um, in, at least in the short term, it looks more like it's a way of creating more social stratification uh, within the education system.
So, thank you. Hey, I'm the bridge standing between you guys and dinner, so I'm going to try to go through this. Um, you guys are in luck, though, because I haven't done my uh, reporting yet, but I will be doing it in November. My uh, original project was uh, land my, uh, education of landmine and uh, unexploded ordinances of war through sports, which is uh, soccer, uh, in Colombia, but that didn't go through, so I decided to focus on another topic that basically does the same thing. If you guys notice, I really love soccer. Um, and I'm glad that this is being used as a program to help people. Um, so my topic of um, research is going to be um, Native American youth. They're currently going through an epidemic of obesity and type two diabetes. Um, the obesity rates have reached or exceeded over 50% in Native Americans. Uh, Research states that this is going to be the first generation of Native American children who won't outlive their parents. Um, one out of every two Native American youth uh, will develop type 2 diabetes. Uh, the causes of these are food deserts, poverty, lack of physical activity, and um, which is what is increasing uh, the obesity in type 2. Uh, so I'm going to New Mexico uh, in the program. This, there's a program there that is being used uh, to implement movement and education about dietary, dietary education through soccer, uh, golf, and cross country. Uh, the effects of these are sports programs will increase physical activity and implement leadership skills. Uh, they also will create ways for children to be living healthier lifestyles and getting them more active. In addition, uh, there's there's programs that will educate the children about how to live better um, lifestyles. So I'm gonna show you guys a quick video about how, how these programs are being implemented. that they're using sports to implement uh, health education for these Native American uh, children. This is uh, San Felipe Pueblo. The sports, the, the turf field that you're seeing there is the only place that these children have access to extracurricular activities regarding sports. Uh, there's 1,500 Native Americans in this, in, this, uh, in this town, but only 150 of them have access to this field. So that's why I was interested in um, going in there and figuring out, telling other people that there are ways that these Native American people, Native American youth are being helped. Um, so yeah, that's it. So uh, the current uh, director of the school, uh, Norgay, I can't remember his second name, Norgay thing. So he is actually uh, one of the students who uh, who is from the 1998 batch. And right now, he was one of those kids who dropped out of school and he decided that uh, 
what do I do? And then he found out about Sekmal through the camps and then he joined Sekmal. And later on, he learned about these um, different technologies that they were teaching about, the sustainable technology. And then he decided to work, stay with Sekmal and just help them grow. And right now, he just, he doesn't ju just act uh, as the director, but he also teaches, um, he takes classes for uh, sustainable engineering. So I don't know if we would call it a successful example, but he decided to do something good with his life. And then there were uh, three kids uh, whose story I heard, but I could not get hold of them. Uh, and one of them was this journalist who who, uh, who made this video on this on Sekmal only, and later on he he got famous and he uh, received this scholarship from some European university, but. I mean, there were there there are examples of there are successful examples, but there's not one that I've covered in particular except for the director. I think uh, I've kind of had an association with Sekmal. I spent oh. a lot of time in Ladakh. That's why I asked you the question. I think there's someone in San Sanjing Dorje who is a, I think an internationally known documentary filmmaker okay. who I think graduated out of there, and there's Sivang Vivekzin who's also a famous uh, journalist. There's someone named Henry Chora who is a uh, she runs a mountaineering agency. So, so yeah, so it's kind of this. There are fantastic stories out there as well. Yeah, and but those were the people who got like really they they were like they got really uh, you know famous and all that. But then there are other kids who are not at that level, but still they are doing so much better that they if imagine what if there was no segment they would have been just doing some uh, job like Potter or like, you know, just some part-time job, but right now they are confident enough to stand on their own feet and to start something of their own. Yeah. So that was nice. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, Shin, am I saying it yeah. your name correctly? Joanne. yes. Okay, sorry. Um, it may not be a complicated question. Um, you just mentioned that um, that you decided not to include uh, the fact that Hassan had suffered uh, from sexual violence. Was that something he asked you to not include or was that your decision? So so it was mainly a Pulitzer Center's request. And Hassan originally was um, very scared and worried about it because he's never told his family about this. But we convinced him to like let us include that detail because we thought it was very very important that people know about this. But when when um, Pam suggested that we take it out, we we reconsider and we told him that we'll take it out, and he was pretty happy about that. It's mainly because he was a minor, so I thought he's yeah. Right. right. It, it was a very interesting discussion that we had among the staff when we reviewed the the video. And in a way, I think if you have suffered um, sexual abuse, it's actually good to talk about it because it can help prevent it and you're um, helping other people by putting a stop to it. But because of the age, we thought that we should be cautious. And I also think that putting videos out now on the internet is, you know, we're just in a different world. We don't really know what we're getting into. Whereas when films were made before everything was on the internet, there were different considerations. But I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, so you know, I, I, you know, I think we can discuss um, more because it is, it's not clear which way to go, I think. Um, do you want to say anything else? I do want to um, mention, and I should, I meant to mention it earlier, that, you know, I sent you two videos um, a few days ago. One was this video, so you can see the entire piece that you should have a link to it in an email that came two days ago. And then the other video is from Max and Sarah, the people for Trump. So if you want to watch the full length, um, please do. So let's. Um, other questions? Yes, Patrick. Um, Viri Diana, am I saying your name right? Yes. Um, Call me Viri, it's fine. Viri, okay. Um, 
I'm curious about this because there are some Native American reservations near where I'm working. Um, the program that you're going to report on in New Mexico, is that like a national thing? It is. Okay. It's uh, helping around 15,000 Native American children as oh, of wow. today. So it's still going. I'm actually, well, I'm going to be there November uh, 5th, but I'm getting the day that they're starting this whole health week. Uh, so they're implementing a program that a lot of Native American youth from all over are coming down to New Mexico and they're having a cross country race and they're trying to get like the youth uh, to do at least one hour of exercise that whole week. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this program also sponsors and gives grants to researchers so they can kind of tackle the issues that fit the question, why, why is this happening? 